Julian Flores, welcome to the Running Effect podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. If I'm not mistaken, we're recording this on a Wednesday. Wednesday is the, the chill day for the beast. Is that correct? That is correct. Wednesday yeah. is our day off, uh, mainly for the athletes, but for the staff, we're still working. We're grinding away. <laughs> what does that day look like for you? Is it catching up on emails? Is it talking through training with Danny? What does that look like generally for you? Absolutely. Catching up on emails, doing a lot of admin, a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, that's uh, typically what's going to fulfill a Monday or excuse me, a Wednesday. For you, I'm curious, we'll get into your running journey here shortly, but are you still logging the miles? And if so, do you use an opportunity like Wednesday where it's less work to, to put in some more miles than normal? Yeah, I guess my role with the Beast, um, it's pretty versatile. Uh, I wear a few different hats, um, so I got to stay in shape because one of my roles is definitely help pacing. Uh, so I pace a lot of the workouts, whether it's uh, with the 800 crew, 1500 crew, uh, you name it. So uh, getting the miles in is, is an absolute necessity. For you, how much of the pacing is the women's group versus the men's group? I mean, are you pacing Josh? Is it Nia? What does that look like? <laughs> yeah, I think it's what's more uh, convenient on the day and where we're needing my help. Uh, for example, when we were in Glasgow, I was helping Josh through his pre-meet workout and things of that sort. But when we're uh, in in Seattle, there might be a day where Nia needs someone because she's the only uh, female 800 in that group. Um, we still we just signed on Valerie Tobias, and she's been a big help. But there's definitely times where there's going to be one individual that's working out alone. And so if I can jump in with them and help out, I'm happy to lend a hand. Both as a coach holding a stopwatch or as a coach laying down some reps in like the Hyperion Elite Four, leading Josh, does your draw drop seeing some of the workouts he does? Absolutely. Um, I mean, not even only him. Uh, a lot of our athletes, some of the some of the work that they've been putting in this uh, this fall and leading into this early uh, indoor season and heading into outdoors, I think we're going to turn some heads. I think it's going to be electric. It's an exciting exciting time. You mentioned pacing different different people different groups have you ever done like have you ever paced multiple workouts in a day or is it generally you're just like hey just give me one i can only handle one yeah there was one day uh we did a uh, a time trial session i think this was last winter um and i paced i think three time trials that day and so that was that was a rough one but uh, we got through it and we had some great results from it Julian, does that bring you back to like high school days where a coach would be like, you run the 16, 10 minutes later, you run the eight, and then we're going to throw you in the four by four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and going through what they're going through, I think is also beneficial as a coach. You know, I think uh, sometimes you can get a separation that uh, you, you forgot what it feels like to be in that position. Um, and I, I picked that up from Danny mainly. Um, whenever I first signed on, Danny was sure to show up about an hour early before any workout, and he'd be doing the workout that was prescribed on his own for the athletes. And so naturally, I, I wanted to emulate some of that, uh, that influence that he had and, and keep the ball rolling. It's funny you mention that because a recent podcast guest, he was definitely like a little off the beaten road for a running podcast, but he's the director and director of strength and conditioning of Charlotte University uh, D1 football program. But he's also been like a uh, director at like five other D1 programs, including Michigan, who just won the national title in football. Oh, wow. And he he does the workout. He prescribes his guys at 38 years old, like the, the weightlifting sessions before they do it. Um, I'm curious to like dive deeper into that. Why do you think that's so important to experience what the athletes are going to experience before you coach it? Yeah, I think it keeps you grounded. It gives you this uh, sense of relativity. It helps you adjust something if you think you need to. Um, you know your body as well as you know your athletes. And so it, it just gives you a bigger, broader insight. Let's go way back in time to young Julian. Take me through how he got his start in the sport of running and what his first impressions of it were. Yeah, um, I guess I started off playing basketball. That was like my, my first love. Um, and there was one day where uh, a few of us had to run a cross-country time trial, and I ended up winning it, and it uh, pretty much changed my life. Um, the high school cross-country coach happened to be there. This was when I was in eighth grade. I think I was 13 at the time. Uh, he saw my time, came down, and was like, hey, you know, you're, uh, you need to put the ball down. You're gonna, you're a runner. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ran like ten. I think it was. I want to say it was like ten forty uh, as a thirteen year old uh, for Jeez. a two mile time trial. And uh, so it just. Uh, he told me, you know, you you can be on varsity right now. And so I was like, all right, let's let's do it. So I uh, I started running uh, cross country and track and field uh, that year, and uh, I've I've not stopped since. 
ten forty as a thirteen year old who was playing basketball. That's nuts. Do you look back on that and you're like, man, I did not appreciate how talented I was at the time. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, there was a there was a good culture uh, in Hobbs. Um, I'm from Hobbs, New Mexico. It's a small town in the southeast corner of the state, and uh, there was a, a culture being built that. You know, my, my coach changed my life for the better. He's one of the reasons why I'm coaching today. Uh, he, he completely, like, molded and shaped my life. And so with that, I just wanted to, to continue to have that influence. I knew I wanted to be involved in the running uh, realm in one way or another, and, and coaching was definitely that, that door for me. So you do this time trial. You get invited onto the team. You probably realize pretty quickly that you're good at the sport. When did that switch into not just – good at the sport, but like personal ownership of this is something I enjoy. And it's also something that I want to put in work and see even more results. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess following, uh, following that time trial, I ran every year cross country and track and field. I was still playing basketball. Eventually I stopped playing basketball and focused on it for my senior year. Uh, with that, I knew that I had a better opportunity to pursue an academic career with, uh, with running. And it, uh, I, I started as a, a walk-on at a junior college, and I eventually went uh, to a Division II school. I got picked up by Adams State. Uh, I ran for them for a few years. We won a couple of national titles, and then I got my, finished my senior year at UNM. And that's where I met Josh. I was a senior whenever he was being uh, drafted to be a, a, a freshman on the team. Can you speak to the aspect of your story of walking on to a college school? What was that process like of going to college and taking a bet on yourself to walk on to a program? I think a lot of kids these days wouldn't take that chance on themselves. They would just say, I'm going to hang out with the spikes. My time in high school is fun, but I'm going to focus on academics or something. Yeah, so this was back in 2011, um, and it was my senior year. I had run some decent times. I was a state runner-up a few times. There was uh, another gentleman on the on the running scene that just got the better of me quite a few times. And uh, with that, I had run, I think it was 426 in the mile, 942 in the two-mile, and uh, 1510 in the, in the 5K. And so... It wasn't, it wasn't quite enough to turn uh, the heads that I'd wanted to. I'd reached out to quite a few different schools and programs. I reached out to Adam State specifically. I reached out to, you know, every, every big name that you could think of. And everyone was like, you know, you're just not quite there. But if you want to come walk on, then you can do that. And so I, uh, I didn't want to walk on to a university to where I had these enormous fees that I, I couldn't personally afford. And so uh, a junior college for me personally was the, a step in the right direction because you can get an education, you can uh, still complete, compete, and you can prove yourself. And so I ended up getting uh, second in the junior college national meet for the 5K and third in the 10K. And that's what turned uh, Adam State's head uh, towards my direction eventually uh, ended up there. And so it was just this, this process of, you know, continuing to bet on yourself, believe in yourself and, and climb the ladder. I have to ask this because I don't know where this falls into your progression in college. When did you cross paths with the legend BJ Brandon Johnson? <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, me, me and Brandon go, we go pretty far back. Uh, I think honestly, the first time we crossed paths, I was working part time at a uh, running store during college to like you know help help pay the bills, and he was a rep at the time, and uh, he he was repping at our store. Came by, we clicked, and uh, from from there it's history. You know, we have a very very special relationship. I, I consider him a brother of mine, and um, I'm proud of uh, everything he does. So shout out Brandon Johnson. <laughs> So you guys were never teammates. It purely came through him just walking into a store one day. Yeah, yeah. We just met randomly. Dang. Happenstance. I brought it up because I thought you were teammates or something because I know you guys are super close because I'm, I'm, I know Brandon decently well and he's talked about your relationship. So I was like, oh, I'm going to bring it up in relation to Juco. And, but I guess not. I guess not. That's super cool. Okay, let me ask you this. When did you realize or find out that he made beats? This is an interesting <laughs> part of him. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess – we, we both are really interested in uh, other aspects outside of running. Um, I, I'm an artist myself. Uh, I love to paint and things of that sort. And, and he, he he's very musically gifted. Uh, if you haven't looked up any of this stuff, look up Melvin Brando on Spotify. You can find some hot beats there. Uh, he, he's a talented individual. And I guess these uh, 
extracurricular activities, if you will. We just found this common bond in this link. Uh, we have a very similar interest in uh, in music style, music preference, and so we we just naturally clicked and and. Uh, we, I've watched him in the studio a few times making beats. It's pretty magical, man. The guy's talent. Who, who's winning in a marathon? Peak shape, 2024. <laughs> you know, uh, you always got to bet on yourself, so I'm, I'm going to say me. You know, he's going to say him, but I'll say me. <laughs> Take the guy that's facing Josh Kerr. I, I might too. I might too. No hate, BJ. <laughs> I'm curious to – we're just all over the place, but I love it. This is what makes podcasts fun. Uh, let's talk about the artist piece. Where did that come in? To your story was that in relation to college was it earlier on where'd you find a yeah, this, passion for being an artist sorry mom but my mom hates when i tell this story but <laughs> there was one day when i was a kid it's like one of my first memories you know one of those core core stories i uh i was doing this dragon coloring sheet and, you know i was just, i was a kid i was just you know getting after it i i finished it up I'm like running over with it in my hand, taking it to my mom. And I'm like, mom, mom, mom. She's like doing a hundred things. Uh, you know, she, she held out multiple jobs. She was raising three children. You know, she's doing the dishes. She's doing everything. And uh, uh, finally she like looks at it really quickly and she's like, you need to stay in the lines better. And it like crushed my soul because <laughs> I thought I had done really well. And so from that moment, I like went back open the coloring book and I was like I'm gonna stay in these lines and so <laughs> I like just kept working on it it developed into a passion um I majored in in art in college and uh, I still produce art today I'll, I'll definitely want to come back to the artist piece because I'm so fascinated by it but going back to the running piece in college so you run mm -hmm. for a juco school you perform really well turns the head of Adam State take me through the progression to ultimately transferring there and then contributing to that program in your tenure there yeah, Adam State's a, a great school. I think it's one of those uh, programs that where if you're a distance runner, um, it's everything. You know, uh, it's it's a, a place where you go where where you can run and do nothing else. And it, it, talk about culture. There's culture there. Uh, each guy like develops this friendship. Some of my teammates from Adam State are some of my best friends today. Uh, and it's just a, a very very special place. Uh, it will always hold a special place in my heart. Um, during my uh, tenure there, I eventually looked uh, to try and take that next step. I uh, always wanted to go back home, ended up back at the University of New Mexico. Um, and that's where, like I said, I ended up meeting Josh. I ran my senior year at UNM, and it was, it was a great time. As you look back on your years in the NCAA system, what are some of your fondest memories? Yeah, I mean, winning our first cross national title with Adams that was that was a crazy time and we had a pretty pretty stacked team back then that was whenever it was me uh we had Tabor Stevens if you don't know who Tabor Stevens is look him up he's an amazing uh athlete back for D2 back in the day held multiple records in the 5k steeplechase ran for steeplechase uh professionally post uh post college we had Kevin Batt, uh, Australian guy. You know, these were all like, sub fourteen guys. We I think we had four sub fourteen guys on that on that squad. Uh, two, no, three sub four guys, uh, four sub fourteen guys, and uh, and then two ten k guys that were running uh, sub twenty nine. And so it was it was a really really stacked squad that year. And we we showed up to the national meet and, and we dominated. It was it was an amazing time and. Uh, I remember afterwards, uh, all of us jumping into the river when it was like freezing out. I mean, it was snowing on the course that day and, <laughs> uh, it was, it was a special time. How long did it take you to warm up after that? Oh man. Uh, probably at least four hours sitting in front of that <laughs> fireplace in the hotel, <laughs> shaking. You mentioned earlier on that you crossed paths with Josh for the first time your year at University of New Mexico when he was kind of being recruited there. What were your first impressions of Josh Kerr? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the first time he showed up, I didn't think anything of him. He was a young kid. I knew that he wasn't 18 yet. And so I was like, what are we doing recruiting this guy? His time wasn't that crazy. But Joe uh, saw something in him. Um, and he ended up running a, a great 15 later that season. Uh, and eventually, because of that early connection Joe made, he came to UNM. The first time I ever heard or came across Josh Kerr was watching the NCAA Indoor Mile, and I was like, I was so young at this point. I was just a fan of the sport, and the only person I knew on the track was Edward Cheswick. I yep. think I literally 
like went on my mom's tablet and went on to like ESPN go just to watch Chesrek win the mile title. My jaw <laughs> dropped. I was like, what's going on? I was like, who is this who freshman? Is this yeah. <laughs> it makes sense speaking back on 2024, but uh, what was your impression of that race and, and seeing that recruitment come to fruition? Yeah, I mean, Josh was like one of those individuals that came onto the team as a freshman, but very easily found uh, a leadership role. Um, and he continues to do that on the on the team today. Uh, he he's a, he's a different individual in the aspect of he's extremely consistent. That's one of his greatest superpowers. And uh, he does the right things every day. He chooses, chooses to do the right thing. I got to ask, Josh has talked about uh... – what did he talk about this past year? Basically like giving away his phone and having a burner burner phone. I'm assuming you have that burner number. You're one of the select contacts that, that gets the burner phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of, one of the few. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so anytime uh, we're going into like a major championship or a major race, uh, a lot of times there's a lot of distractions from the outside world, whether that's social media, whether that's people uh, wishing him good luck. And it's not to say that's negative by any means, but there's just a lot coming in. And so if you can take a step back and really focus at the task at hand, it's, it's beneficial for, for the end goal. And so uh, he made a decision, I believe the first, it was, first happened in Doha. So this was pretty early decision on, you know, and this was... Uh, like I said, he, he, from a young age, like makes these uh, mature decisions to, to put himself in the best position spot possible. And so whenever you can focus more at hand, having that burner, burner phone with only like a few people that absolutely need to get a hold of you, if worst case scenario happens or if you need a hold of them, it just helps limit the distractions. Another thing I think he did was he hired like a personal chef. I feel like he, he went all in last year and that obviously paid off. What what do you think that did for the culture at the Beast in terms of like, I think a lot of professional runners train the same, live the same. And then there are those just mm-hmm. like freak people like Josh who just take it to the next level. What do you think that did for the team going into 2024 after seeing him kind of go what I like to call zero dark 30 mode, just like locked in? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm personally biased. Uh, the the person the the chef he hired is my wife. So oh really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Podcast so, exclusive. Her, <laughs> her name is Nicole Flores. Um, she uh, <laughs> she she pretty much uh, she gets help and advice from our head nutritionist and team doc, which is Dr. Kyle. Uh, they help. He essentially builds the macros that we are looking for for each athlete, and she develops a menu and meal plan based off of that. And so it's just another thing, like I said, whenever you're dealing with uh, athletes at the highest level, um, so many of them are matched on whether that's leg speed, uh, whether that's, you know, how fast can they run a quarter. It's but whenever you dial it down and look at, you know, the, the minute details that that's, helps make a difference. It helps you make a difference from a confidence level. It's not always about ability. It's, uh, you know, above the shoulders. So now that word is out that your wife is Josh, personal chef. Are other people on the team like, hey, I got to hire her this year too? <laughs> yeah. So right now she has four athletes on our team. She's uh, she's cooking for Josh. Uh, she's cooking for Isaiah Harris. She's cooking for Kyle Langford and now Brandon Miller. I love it. I love it. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. A minute ago, we were talking about your time in the NCAA. I could mm-hmm. be mistaken here, which is why I want to ask you about it. I remember seeing you with Brooks, I feel like before you were a coach, were you signed to them and then came into the coaching role or was it coaching role from the start? Yeah. Uh, so whenever I first graduated, um, I was still in Albuquerque at the time. Uh, Josh uh, had just had that performance at the indoor meet. Danny was looking at him. They ended up recruiting him. He signs with Brooks. During that time, Brooks allows him to finish his uh, collegiate uh aspiration so he can get his degree and he was still training and living in Albuquerque so with that he needed someone to train with I was help training and pacing with him I still had uh, aspirations of my own and naturally like that that relationship started to foster Brooke started helping me out with gear Um, I ended up running uh, 216 in a marathon off of Josh's 1500 meter training (laughs) casual uh, flex yeah (laughs) And then Brooks uh, sent me uh, on a, a hometown hero contract. It was essentially like a just a, a stepping stone. Um, it's not quite a, a professional contract that we see today, but in the sense that it's bonus incentive 
based on uh, how you run performance times and uh, helping out with gear and travel. And so following that, uh, following the trials, uh, I got a little bit burned out, um, was trying to figure out where I wanted to go next in the sport. And this position opened up uh, for the assistant coach. I applied and here we are. The rest is history. What was the, the call or email? What was your reaction to hearing that you got the job? <laughs> it's actually a funny story. Once uh, I actually re received news, I, I had the job. Um, so, I mean, it was a, it's a dream job, of course, because it's everything that I could have hoped for and more, and it continues to, to prosper, <laughs> fruitful activities of my life today. Um, but going back, uh, I remember applying for the job. You know, they're getting candidates from, like, NFL teams, they're, they're getting crazy, crazy names out there. And so I'm like, I don't even think I have a chance. And, but I put my best foot forward. Like I said, I put myself out there and uh, I felt like I had a lot to offer. I, I don't, uh, like I said, I don't, I don't really coach. I help pace. Um, I, I lead the direction for our social media channel. Um, so I do our photography and videography uh, a lot of the times. And so I, I just laid it all on the table. This is what I have to offer. And I uh, wanted them to gamble and a bet on me. And so they did. And uh, I remember Danny calling me and uh, letting me know personally. He's like, hey, it's not going to be announced yet, but it's yours. And <laughs> uh, it was like I me, mean, Josh was sitting there right next to me. And it was it was insane. Uh, I was I was so happy. It was like uh, I bypassed these like steps that were might be necessary to get to this level, but they were they were willing to take a chance on me, and I'm extremely grateful for that. And the funny story I was to be not to be long winded, but the funny story I was alluding to uh, immediately once I found found that found that call. Uh, my wife and I we always wanted to like live tiny at some point, and so we knew we would have to move uh, to Seattle. If you don't know anything about Seattle real estate, it's bonkers. You know, I think it's like you. The most recent stat, you have to have 215 for a household income to be able Jeez. to purchase a home. <laughs> and so we're like, all right, what can we do? Me and Josh get online. We start, like, scouring the Internet. We end up finding this, like, Airbus, this old 1998 Airbus. I, uh, I call the guy, and I'm like, hey, if you take cash in hand, I undercut him by, like, 50%. I was like, I'll be on a plane and be there tomorrow. So he's like, all right, so me and Josh get on a plane. We fly to Phoenix. <laughs> we find this guy in the backwoods. We don't know if we're going to get killed. <laughs> we're, like, following him down all these mountain roads. Eventually, we get to his house. Uh, we were carrying, you know, cash in hand. <laughs> so thankfully, everything worked out. We handed the cash. We grab this 30-foot Airbus. And we drive it back to Albuquerque. I spend the next month renovating it, and uh, then we drove it to Seattle. And so we, we, when we're in Seattle, my wife and I and now our daughter uh, live in the Airbus, and then we also have a home in Albuquerque. Dang, so it, it still exists to this day. Yep, yeah. It's where we, when I'm in Seattle, we're in that guy. Do you think, how long do you think this will stay in the Flores family? Is this going to be like a thing we'll see generations down the line that it's oh, just going to stay in the family, or are you going to yeah. sell it? <laughs> absolutely. We, we put our, our heart and soul into that guy, so it, it's pretty cool. I mean... Uh, Obviously, again, I'm biased. I, I'm the one who renovated it, but I think it came out really nice. What did that look like? Was it like reading books, looking up on YouTube, like how do I renovate a massive bus? Or like what did that process look like and how long did it take to renovate? Yeah, um, so it, it literally took a month straight because once I got the job, they're like, you have 30 days to get your affairs in order and be in Seattle for the first day. So I was like, all right, that's my timeline. Let's get it done. I was working literally every day, sun up to sundown, until the morning I left. Even the morning of, I was still trying to install our little fireplace in there. But uh, yeah, a lot of YouTube. Uh, thankfully, you know, I, I grew up humble, so we had to learn how to do a lot of things ourselves. Uh, my brothers and, and myself built a uh, addition onto our house when I was 13. Um, so it was like, I, I've had experience in like the construction realm. Uh, I worked like part-time with a construction company when I was in high school. And so it uh, it was it was it was easier said than done, but we got we got to the finish line. What are the biggest ways you think you've grown as a coach since that first day with the beast? That's a good. That's a good question. Um, I think it's more been a uh, I wouldn't say necessarily a maturity aspect, but it's more prioritized. 
um, my time is uh, is spread thin, and so I have to really allocate uh, task by task uh, what's most important in getting the job done. And so it's just been this uh, this whole journey to try and try and figure out how I can not only not just think about myself anymore, but get uh, the people that I I see every day achieve their dreams and their goals. And so that's been a such a such a great experience. You know, it, it's different when you when you're doing something for yourself, but when you're helping someone achieve something that they're aspiring to do, it's it's a whole other sense of gratification that's hard to explain. What are the biggest lessons you think you've learned from working with the fastest individuals in the world? I mean, literally. Yeah, I mean, it's sacrifice. You know, um, everyone has the same amount of time in the day, uh, but it's how you allocate it that's going to make a difference. And the sacrifices that they make have put them in the position they're at. Do you ever have like pinch me moments at practice where you're like, man, this is a crazy reality? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and not even only just at practice. It's a lot of the times, you know, we're, we're traveling all over the world. Um, I remember last, uh, last summer we, it was the first time I had been to Switzerland. I was on this long run at St. Moritz just running in between these peaks and valleys with this river flowing right next to me. And I was like, man, this is, uh, this is, this is my career. And so it's, it's so, so humbling. And I'm, I'm gracious for the sport. I'm gracious for the industry. And it's, uh, it's such, a, such a unique experience. I feel like the, the beasts have always been historically a good program. But I think last year was when you guys took it to the next level with – Josh, Isaiah, Nia, other people on the team, and even people like recruiting Brandon, who was just like mm -hmm. a hot shot in high school and college. What's it been like to see and also be a part of kind of the Brooks Beast becoming a premier track club in the world? Yeah, uh, I would say that it has a lot to do with not only the athletes we're recruiting and the culture we've built, but also the staff. I think we have uh, some of the best staff in the world. Um, our ATC, Sarah Bear, she's amazing at what she does. She continues to try and push herself and learn every day that passes. And the same with Danny. I, I, I'll say it here. He's, he's the best coach in the world, hands down. And so uh, I believe in him fully, and we have this uh, belief in ourselves and, and belief in the athletes. And so it's like I said earlier, it's electric. Whenever you have uh, each individual aspiring for the same goal, it, it's, it's easy to take that next step. I forget. It may have come up on both podcasts with Isaiah and Nia, or maybe on with Sarah, maybe all three of them, because there's the three people from the program I've had on. But they, we were talking about Danny. What does he do? Like um, mixed martial arts, and he's gotten the team into like cold plunges or something? I forget about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Danny, Danny loves uh, MMA. Um, he does a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, he, he works at a few gyms uh, on his spare time. He's fallen, I would say, more into that um, recently in the past. I want to say he's, I don't want to miss, I might misquote him here, but I think the past 10 years now. But, uh, yeah, he, he definitely puts that into uh, the team as well. There's times in the preseason camp where he'll take us to a gym and we'll talk to some of his coaches go through some of the roles and it, it's just a it's a lot of fun what's the cold plunge thing is that an isaiah thing i forget i talked uh, to one of them about cold plunging they said they got yeah. the team to cold plunge with each other yeah so we we cold plunge a lot um it's it's not only isaiah josh cold plunges all the time um marta cold plunges all the time it, it's about doing things that suck you know, it's easy to get comfortable, um, even especially after success. It's easy to get comfortable. And so doing these things that suck and like uh, are, are affecting you in a negative way, but you can still keep a smile on, keep your and it, it's not even only that. There's a lot of times we jump in this cold water and your initial instinct is like to you're like seize up. And that a lot of times that happens in races. You someone cuts you off and you have that that jolt sensation. So it's about maintaining that even breathing rhythm it's about jumping into this water keeping a cool head and and letting it letting it flow be like water let's talk about being an artist some more we briefly discussed it a few minutes ago i think a super interesting aspect of the team of the members i've gotten to speak with is how they all have interests off the track and i think that's so cool and unique i feel like a lot of runners it's just running and, and that's their full day and maybe video games because they're bored <laughs> I feel like the beasts are so cool. Like it seems everyone on the team is uh, picking up an instrument. I think Nia said you guys are mm -hmm. coining yourselves the Brooks Beats. 
Uh, where do you yeah. fall in this lineup? <laughs> or are you just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with my, you know, painting and all that, drawing? Yeah, um, I used to play piano when I was younger. Uh, I haven't played so often since then. Um, I've just had other interests, just like I said, pursuing painting. But uh, yeah, I feel like the, the team is very interested in like in bettering themselves. And that's not to say that like video games or, or any other interest aren't bettering yourself. But having these, uh, these extracurricular activities just, just helps boost. And it's, it's another challenge. It's another challenge to stay focused, stay dedicated to. And uh, especially in the musical world, it, it, takes, it takes effort. It takes consistency. And it, it correlates to the same uh, roles that we're trying to instill with them when it, when it comes to running and that they've already have. And it's not to say that we're instilling in them. Each one of them already have that. Talking more about, about your painting, where do you see that taking you? Like, do you have dreams and goals and aspirations within that? Like you do your own running, your own coaching? And, and what are some of those? Like, I don't even know what the equivalent of like a four minute mile is in painting, but whatever yeah, that is, yeah. are you chasing after it? No, I think, uh, so whenever I was uh, in high school, I always told uh, my coach that whenever I grew up, <laughs> that I wanted to be in a gallery and I wanted to be a coach. And so I'm, I'm pretty close to, to achieving that. I, I just need to keep, keep chipping away and, and keep believing in myself. And so that's definitely, definitely something that's not going away anytime soon. I'm hoping to uh, do a show this fall. Um, I've done one show so far. It was called Icon. It was about uh, portraiture. Uh, I wanted to figure out a way to utilize uh, really bombastic colors like in a gallery setting. Because I started out doing graffiti when I was younger. And with graffiti, you have really strong, vibrant colors. And so I wanted to utilize those colors in one of the most traditional settings you can think of, which is uh, portraiture. When you think about art, there's portraits and there's landscapes. It's the two most basic components. And so I went after portraiture and I love doing portraits. Uh, I love the human figure, the human face and figuring out ways to uh, do it differently. And so uh, the first, first show was featuring I, uh, icons that I found in my life that I was moved or affected by in one way or another. Um, I had that show in Albuquerque. Thankfully, it was a sold out show and i um, hoping to, to keep that momentum going. Where do you see the direction of the Brooks Beast headed this year and in the coming years? We want to be the best team in the world. Gold is the goal. I love it. <laughs> enough said that <laughs> <laughs> as much as you want to elaborate here i uh, i do want to ask you this this question it's a it's a hot topic right now so you don't have yep. to elaborate however much <laughs> you want to jacob versus josh or <laughs> man i butchered his name hopefully he's not listening jacob versus josh uh what's your take on this specifically as not just like josh's coach and pacer but but as a friend has it been entertaining to to see some blows and it back and forth yeah, um, I think a lot of times, uh, depending on like the he said, she said uh, situation, things get skewed in media. Uh, at the end of the day, both of them are trying to be the best uh, athlete in the world, and they naturally have a rivalry from that. Uh, whether it's you, either one of them see it as a rivalry, it, it's besides the point. But I think it's good for the sport. It's good for the entertainment. It, it brings numbers in. And uh, I'm, I'm for it. I'm for, for any rivalry. Uh, I remember whenever there was that, uh, who was it, uh, Chalimo and, and Lopez back in the yeah. day that, that were beefing. I thought that was great. Uh, anytime that you can get these uh, power figures that are combating against each other, um, I, I think it's great. It, it drives interest and it drives numbers, like I was saying. Even if it's, uh, we could even, you could do so much from that. I think Jakob and Josh are like very, they have very specific personalities that I think lend themselves towards getting in these type of things, which are just so entertaining. Other mm -hmm. athletes I've talked to, it's like, you seem like one of these people. You're just like too nice to, to start <laughs> anything or to say anything. And I'm not saying Jakob or Josh aren't nice because they definitely are. But like, what, what's your take on, you know, everyone says like, oh, our sport could use more beef and it's so good for the sport. And I like completely agree 100%. But like, what do you think it's going to take to have people actually call their shot more? Because it seems like so few people do it, even if they're in a place to. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the fan base needs to uh, <laughs> quit being so sensitive. Uh, I think that's going to be one step. Uh, I think we, uh, a lot of the old heads in track and field look at it like they do tennis and golf. 
Um, they, they want everybody to be super respectful, uh, but we're, we're not getting the numbers from that. You, you know, they, they're, it's okay to, to want to beat the person that you're standing next to. There, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with vocalizing that. And uh, I think that if, if the fan base is, is okay with, with us moving in that direction and we gradually start accepting it more and more, uh, I think it's only going to be conducive. Even you mentioned golf and tennis, even those sports, it's been cool on Netflix to watch the the respective series that Netflix has done on them. Mm-hmm. And like there are characters within both. I feel like people in golf, like get at each other's necks and, and say stuff. But tennis, I've been getting so into tennis because of this, like uh, Curios, if that's how you say his name, yeah. such an entertaining guy, like <laughs> so entertaining, brings so many, eye- brings a, a runner eyeball, eyeballs to the sport. And then, um, the even last year, like Ben Shelton versus uh, who who did he play? Tiafo, and he did the the phone number celebration, and then the next mm-hmm. round against Djokovic, he shoved it in his face, and it's like that clip is still being posted in March. I literally saw someone like post it again, yeah. and they're getting millions of views. It's like, guys, come on! Even the super proper sports, they're going at it, and it's working. Yeah, and so even and that's that's a great example. You get these like uh, figures, these heads of the sport that. Uh, slowly can transition this culture that we have. And I, I don't think it's a, it's a negative by any means. Uh, like I was saying, there's, there's definitely right ways and wrong ways to do it. You, you don't need to slate your, your opponent off of no means necessary, but uh, uh, a little healthy rivalry and competition, I'm all for it. We're talking about beef and how we both think it's good for the sport, draws eyeballs to the sport. As someone who's been in the sport, is involved in the sport, or sport currently, are there any other things in your head that if you were like the commissioner of track and field, you would you try to implement and do that you think would grow the sport? Ah, there's, just, <laughs> there's so many things. I think uh, what some of the heads are doing right now with having a global championship every year, I think is going to be extremely uh, helpful with uh, getting us some recognition. Um, I think that's one of the, the caveats that, that we were missing. You, you think... Uh, about the NBA, the NFL, um, there's there's a major championship that the fan base is looking forward to every year. With us, it was spread out every two years, and then we have indoor, and then you have outdoor, and then you have the Olympics, and where does it all fall? And so I think having a little bit more clarity and a general sense of direction, like this is the world championship every year. Granted, you still have the Olympics. I think that's a huge step in the right direction. I think there's other uh, avenues that we can still explore. When you think about racing in general, you think about... Uh, this is a, a hot take, but betting in track and field. I think betting in track and field at a venue would be phenomenal. You can see it done at the Highland Games out in Scotland. They bet there. It's and it's it's a crazy atmosphere, and it's it's extremely extremely fun to be a part of. And so it, it happens uh, with horse racing all the time. I think there's uh, lessons and examples that we can look to that we can follow. We definitely have a younger listener base who listens to this. A lot of high school collegiate athletes who are super passionate about the sport of running, who want to be good at it. As someone who is personally and still is very accomplished at the sport, as well as coaches and is around some of the most successful athletes in the world, what would you say it takes to be great at the sport of running? Consistency and belief. How, how do you think an athlete can develop those things? Because I don't think they're inherent. I think you have to work towards them. Yeah, um, I think one feeds the other. Uh, I think if you're consistent in your pursuit and you're out there every day, it's going to start feeding into your confidence, um, and that confidence can grow and build. Uh, I think that you can't have one without the other. If you're not consistent, you're not going to be confident on race day. Julian, one final question for you, the question I ask every single guest on every single podcast, and now with the context of knowing who your wife is, I know you're probably going to try to slide this one off to her, but this question is for you personally. If you had Gordon Ramsay coming over to your house for dinner, what would you personally choose to make for him? (laughs) What would I choose to make for him? Yeah, you. Your wife's not in the kitchen. Okay, I'd uh, I'd do a Montanza type situation. So I'd uh, I'd dig a hole in my backyard and I'd, I'd smoke some meat. Oh, okay. What what kind of meat? And are there other dishes that go with it? Or I've never heard that word before. Um. If you can do a full bird over uh, over some some nice coals that you have dug in the ground, uh, we used to do this really often out in Albuquerque. I, I had a <laughs> a huge like backyard area where um, every every weekend we'd be out smoking meat. Just we start a fire early in the day, let it burn over, get like about two feet of, of coals, and 
we'd be smoking meat the rest of the day just over over a flame. Julian, really appreciate our conversation, all your insights and inspiration. You're an awesome guy. You bring a lot of energy and fun to the podcast. So appreciate you and best of luck, uh, I guess, with your pacing duties as, as your athletes start to get more fit and also just everything you're doing in life. Keep crushing it. And uh, hopefully next time I get you back on the podcast, the gallery will be in the books. You'll have accomplished that goal. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me.